just a little different. Now, the other thing that we'll notice on the sermon is the length. You saw how short <coughs> uh, Luke's account was, and Matthew covers uh, two full three chapters, five through seven. Um, and if it, when you when you look at that, there's 34 verses. 34 verses um, in Matthew there's 34 verses in Matthew that appear in different places in Luke's gospel so what makes Matthew's Sermon on the Mount so long he he possibly pulled sermons from other times for Jesus and put them all together into one. Because when you look at Luke's, it's, it's short compared to Matthew's. So it's very possible to condense Jesus' sermon in together into categories. Took some of the sermons from other um, places and say maybe Jesus was preaching in Nazareth or Jesus was preaching by the sea or on one of the mountaintops. He took those put them together in his Sermon on the Mount, where Luke may have only recorded what was told to him right at the sea, or right at the mountaintop when he was there. So if you look at that and you see, the, see another discrepancy, the length of Luke's compared to the length of Matthew's, that, that's a possibility as why why that was so uh, longer. Um, Another thing that's interesting about these, both both accounts start the same. Both accounts um, start with a beatitude, the Sermon on the Mount. It's about the beatitudes. They both start with a with a beatitude, um, and both end. with a parable. Now, Matthew's is a lot longer than Luke's, but they both start the same with the beatitude, blessed. They both end with the parable, the parable of the wise man who builds his house on the rock. So, differences in between, but the beginning and the end are the same. Um, So, what's a beatitude? Um, beatitude, or the way these, these verses, each one of them, you, there's different counting. Some people say there are seven or eight beatitudes. Some say there's 11. Um, but basically, they all will start the same. They start with this word. Blessed, and it's a it's a, a Greek word, um, and it means it's a state of being, and and I I did some a lot of research on this today, to make sure I got this correct. Blessed, it means it's a state of being, and and we're going to see this as we go on. It's not instructions on how to act. Not. Not. It's not instructions on how to act. The Greek word means possessing the character of deity, the state, and it's the state of the believer in Christ. So this first one, we all know the first one. Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, let's see if I can find my... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the first one. And depending on how you count, when you look at um, verse 10 of Matthew, the first one is verse 3. Verse 3, it ends with kingdom of heaven. 
And then the last verse, or the chapter, or verse 10, also ends with the kingdom of heaven. So there's a, there's a consistency in how this is presented. And, and I know there's a, um, a term that describes this kind of teaching. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact wording, but what it is, you start with an object, you say stuff bef after that object, and then you come back and you repeat the same object. This, this is how he says it. Okay, Let's, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, Blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are gentle, blessed are those who hunger, blessed are those who are merciful. Verse 8, blessed are the, the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And in verse 10, he comes back to this kingdom again, and he says, uh, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he starts with this idea, the kingdom of heaven, and he lists these things that people are in these categories of positions. You know, there's, there's um, what's the word I want to use? Their character of where they are, it's, he starts with, okay, this is about the kingdom of heaven, and he talks about the poor, the humble, the peacemakers, those that are persecuted, and he comes right back to theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he sandwiches all these beatitudes in between the kingdom of heaven. Now he, he adds another one in here. Uh, when you look at verse 11, he said, Blessed are you when men um, cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven. Your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he, even though he, he's changing a little bit from kingdom to heaven to just heaven, it's still sandwiched in between those, those two passages. So a beatitude, and I, I want to spend a little time on this. We're probably not going to get it all in today. But I, I really believe this beatitude or this character of Christ that's in us, he's saying, and listen, listen to how he says it, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, and this position or this state that we're in is blessed. That means we're receiving the blessings of God in our lives because there's a, there's a place within us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Um, and in this, this on the sermon, uh, that's just briefly what the beatitude is about. And we're going to come back to that. But I want you to recognize that on this Sermon on the Mount, there's, there's three aspects to it. And the first one is, is the beatitude, this blessedness. He, he follows that up with um, so there's a blessedness, the beatitude, and then there's sickle. the ethical admonition, and then he, he concludes this sermon with a contrast between contrast between his teaching, Jesus' teaching, and the Jewish um, legalist. And those, those are the spots where he says, you know, it, you says it, it says it's written, you should not commit adultery. He's saying if you lust for a woman in your heart, you've committed it. So he's taking, he's in this, he's contrasting 
his understanding of the law with the lead Jewish legalistic approach. Um, you know, there's places where he'll say, if you, if you hate someone, it's the same as murder because you hate him in your heart. The Sermon on the Mount, it covers the attitudes, our state of being. It covers the ethical admonitions, and, and we may look at some of those. And then it talks about the contrast between Jesus teaching and the Jewish legal system. What's that word again? This one? The last word. Legal. Oh. My L didn't look too much like an L, does it? There. <laughs> Okay, so back to this beatitude, and, and I'll, I'll, we'll spend as much time on this as we need to, to grasp it. Um, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember, this blessedness is the result of our position in Christ. It's not instructions on how we act. Um, when, when we are saved... When we accept Christ in our lives, we receive justification. We are justified in God's eyes. We are righteous before God, and we can. And our our penalty has been paid for. And he says, at that point, what he's saying here is, we are blessed because we are poor in spirit now. We we don't have that old spirit of the world. Remember, he says. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. We don't have that proud spirit within us anymore. And he's saying, your blessedness is the result of where you are, not what you are doing. Because if we, if we are blessed and, and receive a position of righteousness based on our actions, so if these beatitudes are saying, we need to do these things to be blessed and be in favor with God, then was Christ's work in vain? If we can accomplish in our lives by our power what we assume he did for us, then why would it be necessary for him to, to die if we within our own strength can be righteous or be pure or be poor in spirit. So poor in spirit does not necessarily mean that you're broke. It just means that you, you do not have that spirit of the world controlling you any longer. You have a spirit where you are totally dependent on God for all your things. And when you're in that position, then you are truly blessed of those things. Um, the, the classic New Testament beatitude has three parts. It has the adjective, which is blessed. That's the first part of the beatitude. It, they all start blessed or blessed. Um, the second part is, is the person that it's talking about. Um, a descriptive of that person and in this case the first one that person is poor he's poor in spirit so that's the second part and the third part of the beatitude is the condition the condition Assuring Oops. Okay, so the third is the condition assuring 
blessedness. Okay? So, so, so we start with the first part, is the blessedness of the person. The second part is, who is this, who is this person who's, who's blessed? It's the person in poor spirit. And the third part of a beatitude is the conditional assurance. And how do we get that conditional assurance that this person is blessed? It says, um, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that's the third part. Let me go through that again. So you have what's, what that person is, they are blessed. They are blessed in their favor with God. Who is it that is blessed? Those that are poor in spirit. And how are they assured of being blessed? Is that they, they are part of the kingdom of God. That's the assurance. The condition of assuring blessedness is that he says we are, um, theirs is the kingdom of God. So that's the third part of a um, beatitude. So hopefully when we, when we read these, and we're not going to go through them all today, but when you read these, you'll immediately pick out those three things. It's saying they're blessed. Okay, so then who is blessed? The poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake. And then the last part will tell you what is in that beatitude that assures them a blessing. So knowing that you are in the kingdom of heaven sure would be a blessed position to be in. And you would be assured of that condition of blessedness because you're in the kingdom of heaven. Does that make sense? Um, Matthew's first beatitude, blessed is the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The blessed, that's the person, are identified as the poor in spirit and are blessed because their kingdom is in heaven. That, that's the way that beatitude works. Blessed should not be seen as a reward for religious accomplishments, but as an act of God's grace in believers' lives. Rather than congratulating them on spiritual or moral achievement, the beatitude underscores the fact that sinners, us, stand with a forgiving relationship made possible by Christ. So a beatitude is directing its attention dependence and his assurance of forgiveness and place the kingdom of God. he's saying these he's not saying okay here's what you have to do he's saying you are blessed when you're poor in spirit because you are in the kingdom of heaven um I have a quote here from a, a Dr. Willard. He says, the Beatitudes in particular are not teaching on how to be blessed. They are not instructions on doing anything. They do not indicate conditions that are especially pleasing to God. Um, and I'm going to skip by some of this. They are explanations and illustrations drawn from the immediate setting of the present availability of God's kingdom. So they're saying... This is how God's kingdom is. You are blessed when you're poor in spirit and the way you know it because you are part of his kingdom. You are in his kingdom. Um, when we, we can look at, and we'll close on this, we can look at Psalm 1, one another beatitude, if you will. It's, I know it's not in the Sermon on the Mount. It says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sort of sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and, wherever, and in whatever he does he prospers. Um, that particular psalm, it's talking it's, again, don't see it as an instruction. It's a place where we should be as a Christian. It's a place that's um, 
available to us because the Spirit of God lives within us. And he says, how blessed is the man who does not walk? He's, it's saying that this man does not do these things because he's got the Spirit of, of Christ living with him. Although this is an Old Testament, but it's still, it, it's applicable. Um, And whatever he does, he prospers. So um, we'll, we'll look a little more about at these next week with the, um, the other parts of the Sermon on the Mount. But I want you to, to take a fresh look at the Beatitudes. Don't see them as an instruction guide. Okay, if I want to be blessed and be a part of the kingdom, i got to be poor in spirit. Recognize that these, this is the spirit of Christ that lives within us, that directs us. And as we respond to him, we find ourselves in those positions. It's not like we strive for that. It's a part of us, and we release that in our lives, and that's when the blessedness comes in. Okay? Father, we thank you.